Good morning, everyone. Good morning, PCGS family. Students, I hope you enjoyed your break and that it was not all filled with games and entertainment only, but you were truly refreshed, especially in your time with the Lord, in prayer, in reading the God's Word, in silence, and just enjoying the life that He has given you as a gift. Uh, we welcome our new member of our praise team, uh, Miss Lovely Sunog over here. This is her first time to help us in our recording. And uh, we are glad that we could uh, minister to you through song and through the Word of God uh, through this chapel time. So, William Shakespeare once wrote in Romeo and Juliet, What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. For the most part, this is true. In our contemporary culture, obsessed with popularity and engrossed with the constant branding and rebranding of products, places, and even personas, this quote offers a sober reminder that it is the substance of the thing or the character of the person and not the label that is most important. Essence before externals, substance before status, reality before reputation. However, in the ancient world of the Bible, a name was not merely a label, but was virtually equivalent to whoever or whatever bore it. It wasn't merely a moniker or a call sign, it often carried the weight of the bearer's essential character. As the person's nature shows, so his name goes. Names are highly important in the Bible, and none more so than the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Before he was born, his name was already chosen for him and announced by the angel who visited Joseph, the betrothed husband of Mary. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he, he will save his people from their sins. That's from Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Christopher Wright, a Bible, Bible scholar, wrote about the meaning of the name of Jesus. The name Yehoshua, or Joshua, Yeshua, or Jesus, means Yahweh, is salvation. Through the arrival of Jesus of Nazareth, God was bringing in the promised new era of salvation for Israel and for the world. Because through Jesus, God would deal with sin. Salvation, in its fullest biblical sense, involves more than the forgiveness of sin, though that lies at the deepest core of it, since sin is the deepest root of all the other dimensions of need and danger from which God alone can save us. Because Jesus himself is God, his salvation encompasses the whole of our existence. We are not only saved from sin and death, we are also rescued from guilt and separation from God, from ignorance of truth, and from bondage to vice selfishness, and destructive habits. We are freed from the fear of demons, death, disease, and hell. We are delivered from the guilt of the past, from anxieties over the future, from hostility with others, from the debilitating despair over ourselves, and from the domination of the world, and from the quiet misery of a meaningless life. Saved by the great Lord God himself, our Creator and Savior. He is the one who forgives all our sins and heals all our diseases, who redeems our lives from the pit and crowns us with love and compassion, who satisfies our desires with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Should we not be overjoyed with that? This saving God incarnate is the promised one prophesied in Isaiah, it says, therefore, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called 
wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Jesus, the Savior, possesses a name that is above every other name. As we read in Paul's letter to the Philippians, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The reason is that Jesus the Savior is the Lord God himself, the sovereign creator of the universe, the same God who spoke through the prophet Isaiah, there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior, there is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. They will say of the Lord, they will say of me in the Lord alone, our righteousness, salvation, and strength. In the name of Jesus, Yahweh salvation is the name above every name, worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. Let us celebrate and honor that name today. The name of Jesus is a refuge, a shelter from the storm. Help to those who call the name of Jesus is a fortress, a saving place to run, a hope unshakable. The name of Jesus is a refuge, is a refuge, a shelter from the storm. Help to those who call the name of Jesus is a fortress, is a fortress, a saving place to run, a hope unshakable. When we fall, you are the Savior. When we call, you are the answer. There is power in your name. There is power in
Shall we pray? Dear Lord Jesus, the name above all names. Jesus, the name that means Savior, Rescuer, and Deliverer. You are all these things and more. This is the name that embodies power. When the name Jesus is connected to your will and authority, nothing is impossible to accomplish. I worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. We bow down before you, Lord Jesus. We honor you with all our heart, mind, and soul. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for honoring us with your presence. Thank you for honoring humanity with your life. Thank you for allowing us a glimpse of God and a peek into eternity. Thank you for creating the way for us to know you more fully through your time on earth. Lord Jesus, we pray that you will help us live in the level of humility that you did. You are God. You created the universe. Your infinite wisdom and knowledge reach beyond the stars. Yet you humbled yourself and came in the form of a man as Jesus. Lord Jesus, we confess that at times we take your name in vain or take it lightly. We use it without the reverence that your name deserves. We are sorry for that. And we ask that you please forgive us and cleanse our minds from such superfluous uses of your name. Let us cherish and treasure your name as it should be cherished and treasured. For your name's sake, amen. Is 
Good morning, students, faculty, and staff. Welcome to our chapel time this morning. I have a question for us to answer this morning to begin our sermon. Have you ever heard your classmates or your parents or even strangers, people you don't know, using the name of the Lord, our God, in vain? Or have you even tried using the name of God in a meaningless ways or in a disrespectful manner. For today's chapel sermon, we will understand the meaning of the holy name of God and why is His name holy 
and why we shouldn't use his name in an unworthy manner or in vain. Many people actually use uh, this expression, OMG, but they don't know exactly what that means. And biblically, they are actually violating the third commandment of God. So for today's sermon, we will be talking about honor the name. You might be asking, what's with the name of God? Why do we have to honor his name? Is he honorable? And why do we honor his name above all names? Let us find out as we study the scripture, specifically in the book of Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. So you can see in your screen, this is taken from the English Standard Version of the Bible. And as I read, as I read, I want you to follow with your eyes. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, in order to appreciate the meaning and significance of this commandment, let us first notice the interesting fact that God has special name. And you can see there are two words, the word Lord. And as reading the third commandment, we may too easily assume that the word Lord here and God are in the same meaning. However, the former is written with four capital letters indicating something special in this particular uh, word or title for the deity. So you can see there in your screen the word Lord with four letters, all capital letters, L-O-R-D. And we read that as Lord. And then you have the two, uh, three, I mean, letters, the word God. And later on, as we continue on with our sermon this morning, we are going to identify the differences between the two at the same time. Why is it this word Lord is holy? So... There you can see the word Lord and the word God there. Now, what is the difference between the all capital letters word Lord from the only one capital letter word Lord? Uh, for my grade 10 students and for those former students who are already in grade 11 and 12, uh, probably you've heard me uh, sharing with you during your class, uh, Bible class, and even grade 7 and grade 8, uh, I always emphasize the differences between the two words, the one with all capital letters and the one with only one capital letter. So let's begin with the all cap or all caps no, word Lord. That is from the Hebrew word Yahweh, as mentioned by our praise and worship team this morning. And in our translation, we call it Jehovah or Lord. So this is actually the personal name of God. And um, Sir Castro this morning, our praise and worship leader, um, explained at the beginning of the worship, uh, worship service or chapel time, I mean, uh, gave us a parameter about the name of God, that the name of God also bears its character and essence. So in an ancient time in the Hebrew Bible, most especially, in, uh, I mean, in the Old Testament, when the parents of the Jewish people give name to their kids, that is not only a name, but they make sure that the person who bears the name would reciprocate what, what's the name or the meaning of their names, like Yeshua or Joshua or Jesus. Jehovah is my salvation. So here we can see that the all capital letter word Lord is the personal name of God. This spelling is usually used when God's proper name is meant. The Hebrew without vowels is the YHWH, also known as the Tetragrammaton, that no one knows for certain what the proper pronunciation of this should be. But other translations are Yahweh, 
or Jehovah. It is a name that speaks of God's self-existence and eternal nature. So when we encounter the word Lord here in the Bible, all capital letters, this um, attributes to the personal name of God. It is His name. And there's an example there where we can see first, word Lord with all capital letters appeared in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3 verse 4 when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look God called to him from within the bush Moses Moses so that's the scenario where the Lord um, the Lord appeared to Moses in a burning bush and another word I mean same word but with only one capital letter so this is from the, uh, the word Adonai. The Hebrew Adonai was translated as Lord to distinguish it from Yahweh in the New Testament. So in Greek, it is kurios, which simply means master, whether referring to God, Jesus, or a general authority. So here we can see the differences between the all capital letter Lord and the only uh, capital letter L for the word, another word, Lord. So here it's very different. It's Adonai compared to the Tetragrammaton YHWH, which is Jehovah or Yahweh. So specifically, this word Lord here is Master. So it is a title. No? Students, in Psalm chapter 8, verse 1, we can see. O Lord, our Lord. So we can see here the two same words, but the, gram the, the structure is different. Okay? So the Lord here with all capital and the Lord with only capital L. So we see here, O Yahweh, O Jehovah, our Lord or our Master. So the name, the personal name of God, you call the personal name of God at the same time, you put yourself in a submission to the lordship of God. So the author here, or the psalmist, who is David, he said, O Lord, our Lord. He is trying to say that, Lord, you know me because he is a personal God. That is the name of God, the personal name of God. And he said, you are my master. So let's continue. Let's now proceed to the all small letter word Lord, or in the same, it's Adonai. But at this point, this is someone or something having power, authority, or influence, a master or ruler. The same idea with, we have discussed uh, a while ago about the, all, uh, the, small, uh, the big letter L with all, uh, for the rest, small letters. This still refers to any other gods and goddesses. But this title is not given to the God in the Bible because the God in the Bible is the Almighty God, the absolute ruler. And he must possess or be titled as the Lord or Lord with a capital letter L, not with a small L. So this Lord here only attributed to the gods and goddesses of this world, not the God of the Bible. So in Exodus chapter 3 contains the story of this special name of God. If you're familiar with Moses and the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, God tells Moses that he intends to deliver his people from their Egyptian oppressor. Also, that story, Moses is to go to the Israelites and say that the God of their fathers has designated him to lead, or to lead them out of Egypt. And so at this point, Moses said to God, he was talking to God, he was talking to a burning bush, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your father, father has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God replies to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel 
I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Israel, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So the word I am here and Lord are obviously synonymous terms. So the word Lord, standing for the four Hebrew letters, Y-H-W-H, in this passage, is translated to, in English word, means Lord. This is God's special name, forever throughout all generations. Incidentally, uh, faculty and staff, students, this name of God is sometimes written in English as Yahweh. So we should not get confused with it's either we call Yahweh or Jehovah or Lord. It's all the same thing. So let's go back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. That's the third commandment of the Lord given to Moses. So here we highlight the word Lord. So much to the point of this third commandment is the way in which we have come to use the word Lord for Yahweh. The Jewish people, okay, let's go back to the historical side of this or the background of this particular uh, verse. The Jewish people, for fear of breaking the commandment, would not dare to pronounce the name of God. That's how, for them, uh, holy the name of the Lord. So it was too dangerous to do for them because they might take it in vain. Therefore, instead of saying Yahweh or Lord, they came to substitute another word more equivalent to our English word Lord. They would read Yahweh silently, but on their lips it became Lord. So during their time, we have these secretaries, but they call them scribes. Those people who translated, those people who preserved the word of God uh, in parchments or they write the word of God in vellum or in a papyrus. So they call them scribes or ancient writers or secretaries. Uh, their position can be compared today as lawyers. They are really careful to write down the very name of Yahweh or Jehovah. They make sure that before they write the name of the Lord, they wash their hands, and to some degree, they take a bath so that they can be ritually clean as they write the name of God in a papyrus or in a parchment or vellum or whatever kind of materials they use to write on to preserve the word of God. They never mention or say the name of the Lord for the fear of using them in vain. That's how Jewish customary or that's how Jewish scribes considered this name as a very holy name. So the third commandment traditionally then has led too much concern about the sacredness of the divine name. In Exodus 3, 1 to 6, do not come near, put off your shoes from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Which this particular story of the divine name also tells prior to that event of God speaking to Moses out of the burning bush and impressing upon him the divine holiness. So here we can see that if God is holy, then surely the name is holy also. If one should not come near to the divine presence of God, then he needs to be equally careful about the divine name. It is proper to say that a basic concern of the third commandment that we have read a while ago is the holiness of God. Our reverence for Him 
is clearly demonstrated by the way in which we use his holy name. Now the question is, do we use his name in a profane or in a reverent manner? Do we use it in a profane or in a reverent manner? So obeying the third commandment, first, I propose that in religious activities such as worship and prayer, scripture reading and pious conversation, we must avoid taking God's name in vain. Indeed, it is within the context of religion itself that this commandment may be broken most seriously. But does this mean that one must avoid the use of God's name in whatever its expression? Or Lord, or the Jehovah, or the Yahweh, or the Eternal, etc.? The answer must be no. However, much we may respect the Jewish person who tries not to speak God's name at all, and however much our translation of Yahweh into Lord also has been influenced by tradition, we are not told that the name of Yahweh or Lord is not to be used at all, but that when used is not to be taken vainly or profanely. The real violation of the third commandment in religious acts, therefore, is that of using God's name in a light, empty, or thoughtless fashion. I was teaching in elementary for five years here in PCGS, and I heard some students using the name of God in vain. And in high school, almost three years now, by the end of the school year, during face-to-face -face classes before the pandemic, I heard also some students using the name of God in vain. They thought that they are just some sort of expression, but it is not. The name of the Lord is holy. So therefore, I decided that part of my curriculum, I inculcate these teachings about the holiness of God and the holiness of God's name. So that's the per first point in order to obey the third commandment. In religious activities such as worship and prayer, scripture reading and pious conversation, we must avoid taking God's name in vain. Obedience to the third commandment means, secondly, the avoiding of all profane use of God's name in common speech. If the breach of the commandment is most serious in religious matters, we do not mean to imply that profanity is the commonly accepted sense of the term is a light manner. Profanity is indeed a sad and dreary business. It is the use of the divine name God, Lord, Christ, and so on, not as an act of worship not as a topic of sincere um, conversation, but as a means to some human end, to express strong emotional feelings such as surprise, anger, or disgust. So we can say that profanity of God's name is a vicious evil because in its indulgence, God is no longer God the one who stands before and above all else. His name is tossed around vainly to express one's own self-centered feelings. In profanity, God becomes one's servant and God's name one's own petty tool. So students, faculty and staff, we might sometime, sometimes use the, you know, the, the expression OMG, but we know what that means, or maybe you don't know what that means. So now we know that it is actually a violation of the third commandment of the Lord because our God is holy. So is His name. So we are now at the last point. 
obeying the third commandment, finally, to take the name of the Lord seriously is to live for Him and His name and not for one's own. To break the third commandment is not to take God's name upon oneself, but to live for one's own name instead. Every person who calls himself a Christian has taken upon himself the name of the Lord. In the baptismal ceremony, the person is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If the one baptized is a child, the parents promise to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And if the one baptized is of age, he must himself always seek to keep the name of the Lord above his own. So here we can see, if you remember the story of David and Goliath, to keep the third commandment means to come and go in the name of the Lord and not in one's own name. David standing before Goliath and saying, You come to me with sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. That is in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. This represents magnificently one who sets the Lord's name above his own and comes and goes in that name. So it was with Jesus Christ himself. For it was of him that the multitudes cried, Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. In Matthew 20, 21 verse 9. And surely these words apply to all who take the Lord's name in such wondrous fashion. So to end this, students, teachers, and staff, a person who has no need to boast of himself, but whose strength, pride, and joy are in the Lord, is not only richly blessed in his own life, but is also a benediction to others. There is a radiancy, an outspokenness, and a concern for all people stemming from his commitment to God, which makes, which makes him like a refreshing stream flowing into the lives of others, since he does not come in his own name but the name of the Lord. He is not introverted but extroverted. He is not ego-centered but other-centered. The world is expansive around him and the world rejoices in his presence. So I encourage you all listeners that we should be a person who honors the name of God above our name and so we'll become like a streams of water that flows out to other people. We're not only a blessing to other people, but we are also become a benediction to them. And so I close with this quote. You shall not to take the name of the Lord your God in vain through false worship, profanity, or living for one's own name. Let us all seek to live only for God's glory. May we ponder God's word today and apply his word in our daily lives. May the Lord bless and keep us all. Have a great day.